Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for joining me virtually. So sorry that this had to happen under these circumstances and that uh, these these events just keep happening in our lives and they're very uh, disturbing and um, you know we just have to put up with them. So thanks for your flexibility. Um, I hope it helps that you can watch this pretty much anytime you want between now and next week. Let me break this up into two sections. I'll talk first about the Vietnam War. Uh, hopefully you've done some of the readings and maybe seen one of the movies so far in the CNN section sessions, and that'll give you some background. And I'm going to go through a fair amount of information uh, that covers, for me, the main points about the war. There's a whole lot that could be said, of course, but uh, only so much in the time that we have. So I'm going to start with that. <clears throat> and then after a break of whatever size you determine, because you will have the recording, then we will go on to the skill building session, which is going to amount to essentially how to read a book and how to read a declassified document. So those things should be pretty evident as you watch this video. But if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or just raise a question at class next time. So let me start with the uh, with the Vietnam thing, I'm going to share my screen and show a PowerPoint, and I hope I can set this up right. Okay. Okay, first slide. Just a few things that would be good for you to keep in mind as we, uh, as you hear about this event uh, and any event, actually anything that you're that you're looking at. But in particular, um, with respect to the war, here are some things that I think are good to to keep in mind. And I'm going to put this PowerPoint up on Blackboard afterwards, so you can refer to. Uh, to this and to any of the other material um, at any point. Okay. So I'm going to start with some background to the war, ask how the U.S. got involved and later escalated it into a full-scale war, uh, a long section on kind of milestone events under each U.S. president that uh, who prosecuted the war, ask what the effects and ramifications were, and if we have some time, uh, get into why is the war, the war worth studying? And I really wish that we could have been doing this in person because I really wanted to hear what you all had to say about these things. So uh, I may just go through them myself and then we can discuss them, hopefully, if we have some time next week. Uh, and of course, I'm going to toss in a few points along the way that, that I hope will be of interest. So uh, here's the part of the world that we're talking about. Always good to have in mind where you are on the map. And uh, of course, Vietnam is, is our main focus, but it's part of, uh, of, of Southeast Asia and uh, all of that region played a part in the Cold War to varying degrees. So let's start uh, by looking at some of the key places here. You'll see uh, up in the North, Hanoi in the green, uh, of course, the capital of North Vietnam. Next to that, the Gulf of Tonkin. We'll talk about that. Uh, right at the, the second parallel line there, right above the word Vietnam, is the city of Da Nang. And I was going to ask you what the significance of that was. And it is that uh, it was the, the place where the Marines first landed in 1965 when LBJ uh, put American boots on the ground. There had been advisors there before, but not uh, uniformed Marines and military uh, conducting an overt war. Uh, I was also going to ask you what that parallel is, that line that cuts through Dan Da Nang, and it is the 17th parallel, which is the dividing line that was set up at the Geneva Conference in 1954 that agreed to divide the country into two. And of course, that's where much of the problem lay because the leaders of the North were intent on unifying with the South at whatever cost. 
and that made it essentially a, a giant civil war. Down in the south, uh, where that um, that inlet is, is uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Of course, this is a modern map. It used to be called Saigon. And for some people, they still call it Saigon. Uh, and there's a section in, inside Ho Chi Minh City that apparently is also called Saigon. So that's where all the, the you know, the, the U.S. and Western press hung out and uh, all kinds of intrigue happened. And that's where the war actually ended in 1975. Okay. So our period of interest starts after World War II. Before World War II, France, of course, was uh, the colonial hegemon in in, in parts of that uh, of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, they were forced to withdraw when Hitler defeated France early in the war, and subsequently Japan took advantage of the uh, the vacuum and moved its forces and its presence uh, into China, well into China, to Manchuria, Manchuria and Nanking and other places. And as you can see down on the left. Uh, and to French Indochina. And they stayed there until uh, Japan surrendered and France immediately swooped back in to, uh, to take over where it had left off. And it was left to the French and various Vietnamese nationalists to fight things out. Ho Chi Minh, as I'm sure you all know, was the, the lead figure in the North. He was uh, by that time a legendary uh, personality a longtime uh, revolutionary. He had communist beliefs, but it's a, a big historical debate to what extent he was driven by his communist uh, proclivities or whether he was mostly a nationalist and using uh, the, his, his alliances with the communist powers to, uh, to prosecute his side of the war. Um, Ho had tried multiple times in the past to connect with U.S. presidents, starting at Versailles in 1919, tried to reach out to Woodrow Wilson to no avail. And uh, at least eight times during Harry Truman's presidency, which started in 1945, April 12, 1945, is when FDR died, um, until uh, until 1953, when... Um, when uh, Dwight Eisenhower took over, Ho tried at least eight times to make contact and to plead his case and to get uh, U.S. backing, U.S. support for, for his efforts because he understood America's uh, history as an anti-colonial um, enterprise and hoped that we would stand by our beliefs and the, the wording of our Constitution and Declaration of Independence and uh, for whatever reason, the American side simply ignored him. Um, there's a, a whole you know, history to that saga. I think it's fair to say that um, Ho should not be singled out. Uh, sadly, I think it was uh, more of a pattern on the American side to not pay much attention to small fry, to uh, small players, on a map that American, even American leaders were not very familiar with and were distrustful of uh, people like Ho, who, whose backgrounds and, and um, inclinations they were not entirely sure of. So it's a, it's a complicated history. Um, in September, 1945, Ho declared the independence of, uh, of Vietnam, it was not accepted by anybody particularly. In the, the following spring, the French accepted it, but within very constrained parameters uh, that would have contained Vietnam within a, a French-dominated entity. And Ho was not satisfied with that. And in that year, 1946, full-scale war broke out um, between the French and, and the Viet Minh uh, Ho's forces. Uh, this is a, a fascinating picture uh, back in uh, it, during the war in the 1940s. I think everybody knows what the OSS was. The Office of Strategic Services was essentially the precursor to the CIA, a mostly intelligence organization, but they conducted other operations. And here's an example of, of Ho uh, in the middle 
uh, hanging out with American intelligence, something that would really be a surprise to people in the 70s who, who wouldn't have had any idea of this history. Uh, what is Ho doing with, uh, with American intelligence? And on the left-hand side, uh, in the, the tie of all things, uh, not a very revolutionary outfit, but um, that is Vo Nguyen Zap, as they pronounce it, uh, who became sort of the military, you know, the, the genius, if you will, uh, um, carrying out the North's war against the South. So uh, interesting background here, worth keeping in mind. The French fought for a number of years against uh, the, the Vietnamese without any real success, like some other um, very difficult battles that, uh, that we've witnessed more recently. Um, finally, at a place called Dien Bien Phu, the last French holdout in Indochina, uh, the Vietnamese prevailed. And it was recorded here in a French newspaper Dien Bien Phu has fallen. Um, this was a, a, a terribly significant and humiliating defeat for a former great power, um, even though they had emerged roughed up after World War II. This was a, one of the great colonial powers, and they had been beaten by a small group of, of, uh, of people wearing black pajamas, as the saying went. Um, so this was uh, this was clearly the dawn of a new day in terms of international politics. Uh, by this time, the Americans had become interested in Vietnam. They had had fended it off. Truman was not really interested in in uh, in pushing into that part of the world. He had other things on his mind. But then uh, some momentous events occurred. The first being the uh, the victory of Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists. In, uh, in 1949, October 1st, they declared the People's Republic of China. And this was a huge, um, it wasn't a shock as, as much as just a, uh, a, you know, a terrible clarifying moment in the minds of Western leaders, especially American leaders who now saw not one pillar of international communism, but two with Moscow and Beijing, uh, both now poised in the view of, of many Westerners to try to um, carry out worldwide revolution and overthrow the capitalist system. And this is something that is extremely important to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at these events, both in the past and currently. Keep in mind the difference between what people's expectations are and what the realities are on the ground. And we'll get into this a, a little bit more, but the notion that uh, the communist world was monolithic and had uh, the capability and even the realistic intent to try to take over the world uh, was far from the from the reality at the time. But that's not how American leaders saw it. So October 1st, 49, a big date. And then uh, in June of 1950, the Korean War begins and China is, is seen as behind that. So this is sort of, you know, proof in the eyes of Americans that the Chinese in particular have have their eyes on uh, on on Asia and on uh, revolution. So uh, Truman gets interested because he is a, a, a very active anti-communist. I don't think there were many who were not uh, who were in senior positions. Of course, there was the the question of how of whether there were communists hiding in the State Department as part of the Red Scare of that time period. But uh, among senior uh, officials. You know, everybody was pretty much in the same boat as far as the the fear of communism. Um, so, with the collapse of the French at Dien Bien Phu, the Americans finally decide that they need to get involved, and it takes them a while. This is a photo from from well and uh, after that that time, but uh, this is a, a great representation of of what it looked, what the what the the reality was. Uh, in terms of American involvement. But it took a while, as they say, for, for it to get to that stage. So what was this all about? Why did the Americans enter the war? And again, would love to get your uh, thoughts based on the readings and, and so on, but uh, we'll, we'll have, to, have to pass on that for now. Uh, for, for some states in the international community, 
a lot of this was about colonies and decolonization, uh, which was a, a, um, a phenomenon that had been going on for some years, but was continuing uh, with a vengeance uh, in different parts of what used to be called the third world. Uh, nationalism was a, was a driving force here, and that was also on the minds of, of people in many parts of the world. For the United States, it was a, a really powerful mix of two different broad things uh, in my mind. One is the is uh, clear self-interest. You could put that in different ways, national security, uh, for example, but a mix of, of self-interest and altruism. Uh, the altruism side of things has gotten really kind of dismissed and, and derided uh, in, in at times over the past, I don't know, few decades maybe. But I think it is crucial to understand that aspect of American thinking. If any of you have read the uh, phenomenal book by Graham Greene called The Quiet American, there have been two movies made from it. Uh, Graham Greene was a a sort of a dissolute British journalist and, and of course, novelist who really put his finger on the pulse of American foreign policy in these parts of the world. Um, it, and it's encapsulated in a phrase which I'm going to butcher, butcher but the, the gist of it is uh, as the narrator, who is also a dissolute British journalist who happens to be stationed in Saigon, uh, as he describes his young American colleague, who he believes to be an aid worker, but I uh, will not be you know, breaking any news to you, but ends up being a CIA agent, uh, describes the, what this guy does in the course of, of his work and what the United States does in the course of their, uh, in implementing their policies. He says, words to the effect of, I, I never met a person who caused so much destruction with such good intentions. And that really does say a lot, I think. Um, so the reason for this mix and why it, it was so closely intertwined, these two, these two aspects, is that uh, at the start of the war, or, or I'd say no, but somewhere in the course of World War II, uh, a group of strategists in the United States got together uh, who were called the wise men. It wasn't a club. It wasn't a, a formal thing. It was just a, it happened to be the people who were in power at the time in, in key offices inside the U.S. government. So people like Abel Harriman, who was kind of a glorified presidential envoy to key parts of the world, George Marshall, who had been a distinguished general in the war and eventually became foreign secretary, uh, Secretary of State, um, and uh, on the far right, Dean Acheson, another towering figure of this period, and also a Secretary of State under uh, Harry Truman in, in the hat. Um, and people like these, and there were others, essentially figured out that it was, or decided that it was going to be the mission of the United States once the war was over, to make sure that never again would there be a circumstance where a, uh, a an evil power like Nazi Germany could rise to a point where it posed the kind of global threat that the Nazis did to the rest of the world. So there was only one candidate for that dubious honor as the war was coming to a close. And that was, of course, the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. And that, in, in a sense, is sort of the kernel. This is the, the start of, of the Cold War uh, psychology and, and strategy uh, that, uh, that held sway for four decades or more. And at its heart was an interesting concept that was laid out by a, a historian named Mel Leffler in a book called Preponderance of Power, which I recommend to you. And the basic idea is, if I could distill an 800 page book to a, a sentence or two, the basic idea was that these guys figured out that in order to accomplish their goal of keeping the world safe for the good guys, who of course were 
uh, people like us and people who believed in, in democracy as we defined it in uh, capitalism, in open markets, and all of those things, um, that if we were going to carry the day down the road, then we would have to accomplish at least two things. One was, was to make sure that the resources of the world, the natural resources of the world, such as, I mean, oil will be the most obvious one, but, uh, you know, precious metals, all kinds of things that uh, that different parts of the world um, have in varying quantities, that those natural resources must remain accessible to our side. And secondly, markets in those parts of the world must also remain open for our businesses to have access to. And here again, you have a, a, a real blending of uh, notions of national security and uh, you know, doing the Lord's work. And I'm not really exaggerating with that expression because the idea was so firmly embedded in the minds of these people that what was good for the United States was good for the world. Uh, it, it cannot be overstated. And therefore by definition, the things that we want to do to help ourselves, like keep resources available, keep markets open, uh, are things that are going to help the rest of the world. And they happen to be things that the communist world opposes. Um, and so there you have in this nutshell, this, this very clear concept uh, that that embodies you know, all manner of policies that uh, that U.S. officials put into place over the next four or five decades that may in themselves have looked to uh, people who disagreed with them to be, uh, you know, really kind of puzzling uh, policies and and dangerous and negative policies like, uh, you know, siding with uh, with right wing dictators uh, against popular will in different parts of the world, things like that in and of themselves might not have, have looked like they were, uh, had any redeeming value, but in the minds of these people who were, uh, who made up the establishment of American policymaking, these were all to the good. These were all in the service of the overarching aim of keeping communism at bay and thereby keeping the world safe for democracy. That was how they saw things. Okay, um, now that may all be something that you're already well familiar with, but I think it's it never hurts to emphasize the importance of, of that, uh, that kind of conceptualizing and how, you know, the, the, what kind of bubble it forms around you and how you can, uh, how it can determine, uh, you, you know, world-shaking events. Okay. So another element of, of this way of thinking uh, was the famous concept of dominoes. And I would have also asked you about this. Dominoes, uh, I'm sure that you, you have read about this notion of falling dominoes in the international community is something that was also uh, extremely important as a concept for for all leaders, especially American presidents. So let us, I hope that you can, uh, I'm gonna see if I can share this part of this screen now. And I'm going to play now a, a video, which I, I think you can see. And it will, it's, it's part of a documentary that I could easily have assigned to you, except that it's hugely long, um, but a really good one, Vietnam and television history. And after a second, a few seconds here, you will hear from um, four different presidents on this notion of dominoes. I 
the way, do these look like World War II soldiers? When the United States votes $400 million to help that war, we're not voting for a giveaway program. We're voting for the cheapest way that we can prevent the occurrence of something that would be of the most terrible significance to the United States of America, our security. That, of course, is President Eisenhower, who succeeded Truman in 1953. If we withdrew from Vietnam, the communists would control Vietnam Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go. If this little nation goes down the drain and can't maintain her independence, ask yourself what's going to happen to all the other little nations. If the United States now were to throw in the towel and come home, and the communists took over South Vietnam, then all over Southeast Asia, all over the Pacific, in the Mideast, in Europe, in the world, the United States would suffer a blow. And peace, because we are the great peacekeeping nation in the world today because of our power, would suffer a blow from which it might not recover. Okay. So that was Kennedy followed by LBJ followed by Nixon. Um, and you can hear from from those snippets that this is, in their minds, it's all about the Cold War. It's all about, uh, even though they don't say the word Soviet, it's all about keeping the Soviets at bay. Um, as Nixon says, we are the great peacekeepers because the assumption is the Soviets and the Chinese are out for war. Uh, it's all about credibility. This is a, a word that that shows up countless times in public statements over the years. Um, but it is also unquestionably also about a mix of other motivations, uh, not cutting and running, not you know leaving a small ally in the lurch. And even though they never say this, uh, it's about things like oil and commerce. Uh, and I will just add a, a footnote here. I think it is, it, it's a, a common, idea that American foreign policy has often been about oil as a way of enriching certain people. Um, and I think there's no doubt about that, but I think it is also critically important to keep in mind that there were strategic reasons, not just commercial and money-making and corporate reasons, but strategic reasons for uh, holding on to oil denying the Soviets access to oil because oil was just so critically important to a modern economy and a, a modern war-making machine. And uh, so it just is, it's another one of these, you know, and I'm speaking sarcastically, terribly convenient um, uh, situations where it just so happens that what the strategists see as good for our larger interests also happen to be really uh, convenient for corporate interests. So again, another complicated issue here. Okay, so let's now look at how each president, starting with Eisenhower, responded to uh, the situation here. Let me make sure that I'm sharing the right screen here. Okay. Um, all right, for Eisenhower, flanked by these two famous or infamous brothers, depending on who you ask, the Dulles brothers, if you ever wondered where our local airport got its name, it's from either one or both of these. John Foster Dulles on the right was the, the Secretary of State, and his brother Alan became, secretary, uh, became a head of the CIA. Um, was it was the CIA and OSS veteran, and um, and later became head of CIA, and they were key advisors to Eisenhower. So for Eisenhower, the story essentially begins, uh, as far as Vietnam's concerned, in 1954 with the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, the end of that conflict came about as, as a result of the Geneva Conference, as I mentioned, which was signed in July of 1954. Uh, it declared Vietnam 
uh, would be independent uh, pending elections in 1956. Until then, split the country at that 17th parallel that I pointed out. Eisenhower always thought that Geneva gave away too much. He did not trust the communists. That's an understatement. Uh, did not really trust the accord, did not think it could be um, maintained. And uh, the U.S. said so on, on a number of occasions. Uh, interestingly, not everybody in the U.S. government had the same view. Not everybody saw these interests at stake as being so great. Of all entities, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, sort of one of the core parts of our military, uh, decided in a study that, that this area of Southeast Asia was devoid of decisive military objectives. Uh, so it's interesting to keep that in mind, that this is not entirely a uniform point of view. But Eisenhower and his uh, the Dulles brothers and others tended to see communism as, as simply a, you know, the, the, just the uh, threat that overshadowed everything. Uh, they tended to see communism as a monolithic um, ideology, that there was virtually no uh, departing from doctrine, and uh, they did not believe that there was any kind of significant nationalist component to the thinking of people like Ho Chi Minh and many others around uh, the Third World at that time. Uh, for them, it's all about the dominoes. So protect, to protect those interests and those of the free world, as we saw it, the U.S. turned to this man, No Din Ziem. It happens to be pronounced like a Z. Uh, who was Ziem? Ziem was a, was a nationalist. He was a, a staunch Catholic, staunch anti-communist, uh, and therefore someone that the United States could get behind. I mean, that was pretty much your ticket to support. You could show your uh, anti-communist credentials, and better yet, to show that you were an, uh, actively religious, then um, then you you were you were halfway there for the, with the United States. Uh, Ziem was not particularly notable in any other way, unfortunately. He turned out to be highly ambitious. Um, he was a very decisive individual. He was hardly what you would call a puppet. This is another misnomer that gets applied or, or used to get applied uh, from, for many, many years to basically anyone who was a, a small country or ran a small country and was an ally of the United States. Um, they were seen as puppets, whether it's the Shah of Iran or uh, Ziem or, you know, anybody in, in any of these other countries. Uh, but in many cases, that really was not, that was way too simplistic. And uh, if you just stop and think for a moment, it would not come as a great shock to come to the conclusion that perhaps these people uh, who had ambitions and had, you know, some kind of skills to get to the, to the positions they were in, that they um, were people with minds of their own as well, and that they were pursuing their own interests uh, and possibly just using their great power um, patrons to, to help serve their interests, in addition to some shared beliefs, the, uh, for instance, the anti-communism. But it's worth keeping that in mind. Um, in 1956, Ziem sort of showed his who he was when he essentially blew off the elections that had been called for and agreed to at the Geneva conference uh, two years earlier. The U.S. never came out and said one way or the other, but they the record is clear that they tacitly supported Ziem in this, uh, which is for, you know, it used to be for students of U.S. foreign policy back in the day, one of these moments where the, kind of the scales would fall from their eyes because it they, if you tended to see the U.S. as living up to its principles of uh, supporting democracy and free elections and all of this, uh, what you had was clear evidence that Eisenhower, of all people, I mean, he's about as American as you can get uh, in his his thinking, his mindset, and so on, his worldview, uh, basically saying, no, we're not going to have free elections. Why? Because they understood that uh, the South Vietnamese probably would not win. And I think there is a a statement by uh, General Goodpaster in the CNN video that where he acknowledges this explicitly. Uh, but that's you know that's the way it is. And as I say, Eisenhower, if you were sitting next to me, would say, yeah, but it's because the communists were dominating it, 
therefore, by definition, it wouldn't have been free and we weren't going to put up with that. So, you know, again, uh, another historical debate that has not been resolved. Um, so with that and other actions, though, Ziem turns out to be actually quite a corrupt individual and an intolerant one. Intolerant, for example, of the Buddhists who were a, a very significant influence in Vietnamese society. But um, um, Ziem, of course, was a Catholic. And uh, for, this is not to say anything about Catholics, but in his view, that was uh, the, the true faith. And, uh, and he had no real patience for Buddhists, including uh, putting up with their political influence, which he uh, found a little bit threatening. So by the end of the Eisenhower administration, and this is according to North Vietnamese and other records that we now have, uh, Ho and his colleagues, uh, his sort of partners and uh, comrades, um, were already expanding their effort to mount a guerrilla war uh, from the northern side. And the key moment in 1960 was the creation of what was called the National Liberation Front, the NLF. Uh, otherwise known as the Viet Cong, and I'm sure you've heard uh, about that. So the U.S. was not ready to get deeply involved at this point, but we were sending advisors on missions, and we were even sending pilots accompanied by Vietnamese to conduct uh, certain small-scale combat operations. We were going a certain amount further than the Geneva Accords allowed for, but uh, we were not ready to commit troops at this point. So in comes John F. Kennedy in a new day in American politics. So this young, handsome, uh, also Catholic as it happens, but in, in, it's significant only because um, he was the first Catholic president and the, the, the sort of the mainstream uh, of uh, American power and American establishment was, uh, uh, was, um, uh, was not Catholic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and did not really, it, it caused some problems in, uh, in Kennedy's political life, which I'm sure you have uh, have read about before. Okay, so Kennedy comes into office, but he is also not immediately taken with the crisis in Vietnam. He has other fish to fry. And I would have asked you what you thought some of those were. Uh, Cuba was high on the list. In April 1961, just two months or so after he entered office, uh, Kennedy oversaw the Bay of Pigs operation, which had not been his idea, had it been Eisenhower's idea, and he was forced basically to go through with it. It was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, a summit meeting in Vienna in 1961 in June with uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the wily Soviet leader, uh, did not turn out too well from most people's perspectives because uh, Kennedy looked like a kid and a, a neophyte and, and someone who who you know, would probably be just knocked about politically and, and in other ways by uh, by Khrushchev, who had, you know, fought his way up through the Stalinist system and was a hardened uh, player. So Vienna was something that Kennedy felt he had to kind of live down and show that he was not someone who could be pushed around. And then uh, Berlin, the, the crisis in Berlin uh, in the early 60s was a huge one at the Various confrontations at, at that uh, in that city, divided city, that uh, could have resulted in direct fighting between U.S. and Soviet forces, and therefore potentially World War III. So it's understandable that that was one of the issues on his mind. Um, back to our map, when his administration set about exploring what was going on in Southeast Asia, they really were, were more interested in what was going on in Laos because that was seen as a, the, the major flashpoint at the time and it had Soviet backing behind one of the sides. Uh, in Vietnam, meanwhile, the, the guerrilla threat was intensifying um, and it, studies were being written and people were forming the opinion that uh, this was actually turning into a more serious situation and all signs were pointing in the direction of bolstering the American presence. Uh, Kennedy, though, characteristically did not go for sort of one extreme or the other. He chose a middle road. And the road he chose um, was, in, included 
something called a, a strategic hamlets. Um, his idea was to use limited force, uh, to use advisors there not to fight missions, but to train a counterinsurgency uh, to create these, these hamlets and, and other circumstances that would protect uh, people in the South uh, as they built up a capability to take the fight to the North. Strategic Hamlet, it was a particular um, sort of thorn in the side of the Vietnamese for reasons that you might be able to visualize here. This is, uh, of course, taken from the air, and it, it is an example of a, a small village that was built out of nothing and surrounded by heavy uh, fortifications, uh, sort of wooden stakes and spikes that pointed in different directions. All well and good as far as its designed capacity to protect from outside attack, which was the whole, the you know that was the essence of the North Vietnamese. Uh, battle strategy was uh, guerrilla warfare in the jungles, surprise attack, and so on. The problem was that in order to create these hamlets, uh, villagers were uprooted from their centuries-old homes and forced, herded into these uh, into these enclosed places, and made to <clears throat> to start a new life. And they resented the hell out of that. It was not a natural thing to do, and the, and they uh, decided that the blame fell on ZM, who was allowing this kind of thing to happen. Uh, so that was one of the problems. Um, as for ZM, the administration under Kennedy was split, I would say, over how to deal with him. They couldn't decide whether he was a good guy, whether he was uh, true to his, his faith, whether he would um, come through with reforms that the U.S. was trying to push on him, or was he pretty much a, a, a despot? Was he out just to um, accumulate power and uh, and do as he wanted in his fiefdom? Um, the conclusion was basically he's the best we've got. And this is a, a phenomenon that happens over and over again in subsequent years, uh, more recently in Iraq, if, if the name Ahmed Chalabi rings a bell with anybody. Uh, we're, we're constantly trying to find somebody who has some credibility, can, uh, can run a, a government, can build popularity, and create stability in their country so that the U.S. doesn't have to uh, commit troops or treasure. Uh, to to those campaigns. And more often than not, it seems that it's a really difficult thing to find the right person. Okay. Uh, so ZM does agree to implement some reforms in return for a lot of U.S. aid. And he, he claims that he will broaden the government's base to include other parts of society, but he failed to produce any uh, significant successes. Um, our presence, the U.S. presence in the country continued to grow. By the end of 61, there were only about 3,000 military personnel in the country. By the end of 62, about 11,500, and a year later, over 16,000. So it's a steady growth. Uh, but again, these are advisors, at least technically speaking, even though they did carry out some missions here and there. In spite of that, the growing view inside the U.S. establishment was that the situation was slipping out of their control. There was a lack of any kind of initiative or drive or commitment on the part of the Saigon government. The military was losing ground. They weren't, uh, you know, the Americans were training them in every way they, they could think of, but uh, somehow they, they weren't, you know, it wasn't taking hold in some way. Um, Ziem's brother, No Din Nu, uh, was a, a close uh, was his chief political advisor, in fact, uh, and was became part of the problem. He and his wife, you can see she was a fairly dramatic individual. Madame Nu uh, became this sort of Tokyo. Well, I mean, it's wrong to say Tokyo Rose. I shouldn't say that, but but sort of this this almost mythic uh, figure in Vietnamese politics. Uh, and between them, they created more problems than they probably solved, at least from the American perspective. Uh, New, for example, um, increased attacks against Buddhist pagodas, 
uh, he accused the Buddhists of harboring communists and used that uh, excuse to destroy pagodas and to cause all kinds of problems. Um, a very important moment occurred in 1963 when one monk uh, in a, a extreme act of, of um, opposition set himself on fire. This picture captured by an American journalist named Malcolm Brown that put his name on the map. Um, this was a, a serious, serious moment. As you can imagine, it captured the world's attention um, and it created real doubt in John F. Kennedy's mind. Uh, other officials grew quite frustrated with what was going on. Clearly, the uh, Ziem and, and New were not in control of the situation. And there was it, it even came to a point which we all in my day thought was inconceivable, but uh, the, the same Joint Chiefs who at one point did not see anything strategically valuable in Vietnam uh, contemplated for a time the idea of using nuclear weapons, tactical nukes, to try to disrupt the Northern battle strategy. Uh, so Museum continues to be a conundrum until November 1st, 1963, when a coup is mounted against him by some of his generals with the quiet support of the United States. There's a lot of documentation that shows what was going on. Um, unfortunately, especially for Ziem and Nu, they did not escape. Uh, the idea, at least as far as Kennedy thought, was that they would simply be you know, overthrown and whatever, they would go into exile or they would leave public life in some way. But uh, it turns out that uh, the generals went ahead and assassinated them. Uh, and that was, uh, Kennedy, according to his aides, was visibly shaken, although I'm forced to ask myself how he could be so shocked that something like this could happen. Uh, but that seems to be what happened. And three weeks later, just three weeks later, Kennedy himself is assassinated. And for our story, it, it, uh, it means turning a huge corner uh, because there is uh, this great open historical question of what would Kennedy have done if he had uh, lived and gone into a second term even as president. Uh, the short version, we can discuss this more if you want. The short version is that more and more scholars agree that he probably would not have escalated the situation in Vietnam. There's documentation to show that he was already contemplating withdrawing US forces and um, was going to get us out of there. Um, tellingly, it seems clear that he was not going to do, this was November 63, he died, that he was not going to announce any of these plans until at least after the 1964 elections a year later. So this is a, a very basic and probably well-known lesson to you. Uh, domestic politics is critically important for understanding a lot of what happens in foreign policy. I just want to pause with this picture to, to point out the Kennedy administration's uh, eagle eye for appearances. LBJ was something like six feet four. Kennedy was not short, but he was not six feet four. Uh, this picture shows how the Kennedy clan wanted things to be seen. Who was the boss here? Always interesting to point those things out. Uh, so then what we have is a, a, a dramatic change of, um, uh, of events. LBJ comes into office. Uh, personalities are critically important. He was known to be uh, very insecure for, for one of the most confident, overconfident, bullying figures in American politics in the 20th century. He was desperately insecure when it came to foreign policy, uh, made worse by his connections with the Kennedy family. They did not get along, couldn't stand each other. Uh, it was a marriage of convenience politically. Um, the Kennedys were sophisticated. They were Harvard educated. They were, uh, you know, had uh, they were wealthy, this and that. And LBJ was, you know, certainly not a, I mean, he came from a very modest background, but he was a Texas boy and uh, didn't cotton to 
to these uh, East Coast intellectuals. Uh, that's a sort of a, a very kind of a crude uh, description of it, but it, it captures the essence of it. So here he is on Air Force One taking the oath of office hours after Kennedy was assassinated with uh, his widow Jackie next to him, an incredible expression on her face. Um, the Texas judge Sarah T. Hughes is administering the oath of office here. And again, looking at the, the detail of this picture, I love this little, little tiny detail. Look at her hand and LBJ's hand on the Bible. She, with her thumb, is holding his hand on the Bible. They were friends. He appointed her to be a judge. This You can imagine the, the momentousness of this moment, the emotions of this moment. And it's it's not clear at all who she's doing that for? Is she trying to calm him? Is she calming herself? Is this a, you know, they just clearly are aware of, of, of how huge this historical moment is. Um, and I always like to see those things. Okay, so LBJ comes into office uh, feeling that he has to prove himself. And he has certain sort of personality, personal ideas about things like honor, and uh, uh, you know, cowardice and quitting a fight and things like that that will come into play um, before his term is out. That the war will will be the end of him. And this is him and and Robert McNamara, at one of the endless series of meetings trying to figure out what to do with Vietnam. Uh, as conflicted as he was, LBJ's basic aim was always to win the war. He was caught up in a lot of uncertainty, uh, but uh, but that was. Uh, that was what he knew he wanted to do. And I want to play these two excerpts from his conversations with Richard Russell. Richard Russell being this uh, tremendously important figure in the Senate from the state of Georgia. You can see, I'm just going to show this for a second. You can see what what's happening here. It's called the Johnson Treatment. Six foot four LBJ. Love to just put his face in yours and literally bully you backwards. And this is what it looked like with a couple of other people who were not quite so confident, including the guy on the right, Abe Fortas, who became a Supreme Court justice. And he's clearly just, you know, it's like a kid in a high school hallway uh, with, you know, with, with the big bully on him. Russell, oops, sorry. Russell did not back down. These guys were old friends. They'd been in the Senate for decades. Uh, and in fact, LBJ counted on Russell's advice uh, in, in many difficult moments, including Vietnam. So let me go through these two recordings, which I think you have in your in your homework assignment. On it, but uh, Mansfield got a four-page memo saying that I'm getting ourselves involved and I'm going to get in another war if I do. June 11th, 1964. So this is uh, before uh, before any decision to mount to escalate and create a full-scale war. Uh, and the two of them are talking about, well, what's at stake here and what's going on? Good in the morning. Yeah, yeah, he's taking that attitude down there all the way. And I, I, I in a way, share some of his uh, fear. I do, too, but the fear the other way is more. What in the hell, too? I, I, I didn't ever want to get mess, messed up down there. I do not agree with those uh, brain trusters who say that this thing is... Uh, got tremendous uh, strategic and economic value and it will lose everything in uh, southeast uh, in, in asia if uh, we use be lose vietnam I, I don't think that's true but i think it's a practical matter we in there and i don't know how the hell you can tell the american people you're coming out and there's no way to do it they think that you've just been whipped and you've been run you're scared and uh, it'd be disastrous I think that I've got to say that we're, I didn't get you in here, but we're in here by treaty, and we can't, our national honor's at stake, and this treaty's no good, none of them any good. Therefore, we, we've, we've, uh, we're there, and uh, being there, we've got to conduct ourselves like men. That's number one. Number two, in our own revolution, we wanted freedom, and we naturally look with other people, sympathy with other people who want freedom, and if you leave them alone and give them freedom, we'll get out tomorrow. That's the second thing. The third thing, uh, uh, I, I think that we've got to try to find some proposal some way that, uh, like I now worked out in Korea, that, that we can... Yeah, I, I wouldn't have... Okay. Um, I mean, these are thinking people. You know, the, the Russell shows he's not swayed by the dominoes argument. 
LBJ is a strategist. He's a thinker. He's got his, his steps in mind that he wants to do, uh, but he still can't quite make up his mind. So here's uh, another same day, another um, conversation with Russell. I'm confronted with a, I don't believe the American people ever want me to run. If I lose it, I think that they'll say I've lost, the, I pulled in. And at the same time, I don't want to commit us to a war and I'm in a hell of a shape. I can't do, I just don't Well, we're just like the damn cow over a fence out there in Vietnam. Right, so here, Johnson is laying out that I, I don't want to run. I don't want to be a coward, but I don't want to start a war. And then Russell uses this great phrase, we're like a damn cow over a fence out there in Vietnam. That's right, and Laos, and I've got a study made, made being made now by the experts, which I want you to come over some night and have a drink and see how important the two of them are, whether Malaysia will necessarily go and India will go, and how much it'll hurt our prestige if we, if we just got out and let some conference fail or something. I know all those arguments. But they say that... Uh, well, a fellow like A.W. Morrison said to me last night, said, oh, damn, there's not anything to destroy you as quick as pulling out and pulling up stakes and running. But America wants, by God, prestige and power, and they don't want... I said, I yeah, but I don't, want to kill, I don't want to kill these folks. He said, I don't give a damn. said, I didn't want to kill them in Korea. But said, if you don't stand up for America, there's nothing that the fellow in Johnson said here, Georgia, or any other place, will, they'll forgive you for everything except being weak. Well, there's a lot in that. There you go. I'll forgive you for everything except being weak. He couldn't take that. And it, you know, it, it's all well and good, but it basically, to me, and I'd be curious what you think, it, it, there's a, a clear argument there that says that he, for all of his uncertainties and waffling, he's willing to go in and kill a lot of people. As he says, I don't want to kill these folks, but he's willing to do that in order to stay in office keep his policies going, and maybe even win a, a second term. Um, that's uh, it's, it's powerful stuff, I think. Now, I just also want to say really quickly that people are complicated. So Richard Russell here is giving wise advice, uh, bucking the trends, and standing up to a powerful president, telling him what he thinks, all to the good. This is the same Richard Russell who in 1935 made this quote, very different context. As one who was born and reared in the atmosphere of the old South with six generations of my forebears now resting beneath Southern soil, I am willing to go as far and make as great a sacrifice to preserve and ensure white supremacy in the social, economic and political life of our state as any man who lives within her borders. I mean, it's it just jaw dropping to hear this that, that, and see that he would write this and have it be public. Um, the policies that LBJ was critically interested in pursuing were things like the War on Poverty, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Great Society. All of these things aimed at raising uh, the, the living standards uh, and the, the political equality of African-Americans and other minorities in the country. How could these two be such great friends and have such different views? Another very complicated story, uh, but worth pointing out. Okay, so things go from bad to worse. Um, Johnson eventually decides that he's gonna go in and I'm gonna skip over this somewhat because we're, we're running short on time. But what happens in August of 1964 changes everything. It's called the Tonkin Gulf crisis. Um, there's the Gulf of Tonkin on the left. And what happened was a an American destroyer called the USS Maddox was attacked by a couple of small North Vietnamese uh, patrol boats. This is a picture of the actual attack on the Maddox. This was verified as having happened, um, and it, it created a, a big stir. Uh, now, never mind that it was seen as an unprovoked attack, whereas the document that uh, I showed very briefly is evidence that the Maddox and other ships 
and other U.S. forces were in that region at that time carrying out covert sabotage operations and psychological intelligence operations. Um, and, and therefore, the Vietnamese were hardly acting unprovoked in their minds. Again, depends on your point of view, but uh, the evidence is pretty clear that we were up to something already, and this was a reaction. The big issue was that um, the two days later, August 4th, there was supposedly another attack. And the issue was that the intelligence, the evidence was shaky, but it was taken and molded in various ways that we'll go over in the next week's session uh, that made people convinced that it did happen. And the combined effect of the two attacks were enough to get the president to uh, strong arm Congress into backing what was called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which was essentially uh, to allow the, the administration to use all necessary measures uh, to react and to preserve US interests in the wake of this unprovoked attack. And it passed 88 to two in the Senate and 416 to nothing in the House. It resulted in the U.S. getting involved in a big way in the war. Rolling Thunder was a bombing campaign that went on for three years. Um, back to our map, Da Nang, 3,500 troops land there in March of 65. Uh, the first combat troops to be there. By the end of 1965, uh, we are already up from 23,000 to 184,300 troops. And two years later, over 500, almost 500,000 troops in the country. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to skip over this. We, we, the assumption was that the Chinese and the Soviets were, were hand in glove and working night and day with the North Vietnamese uh, to create you know, global communism. In fact, the Sino-Soviet split had been underway already uh, for, for some time, since the beginning of the 60s. And uh, the papers that we have from Chinese, Soviet, and Vietnamese archives show that while there certainly were uh, things happening and there was a connection, uh, it was not nearly of a scale or with a commitment or with the end goal that the Americans seemed to think was, was the case. Here's Ho with Mao Zedong. Ho did get Mao to commit to send Chinese troops in if the Americans invaded the North, which was one of the ideas in 1965. So a big problem with all of this that would come up for LBJ was he was trying to do a lot of this in secret. But there's this new phenomenon happening, and that was the rise of television. If you remember this scene from the CNN series, uh, CBS is morally safer, witnesses the burning down of a village uh, with no evident you know, reason except the the word of the the troops there that they had there had been some gunfire coming from that village. Uh, seeing these kinds of scenes was a shock, a deep shock to Americans because we'd never seen anything like that before. World War II, we didn't have TV, we didn't have that kind of coverage. All of a sudden, you have this coming into your living room every night. You have scenes like this. You have scenes of torture. You have scenes of death, destruction, um, and body counts going up day by day. And the problem was that uh, it was being countered by American officials saying, no, no, everything is fine. Everything is great. Uh, we're doing better and better. And so it, it, the expression goes, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? And Americans more and more believed their eyes uh, rather than what they were being told. What was going on in terms of negotiations? Why was something happening to try to bring the war to a close? Well, your own GW professor, Jim Hirschberg, wrote this fabulous book on uh, the secret negotiations that went on. And the gist of it is to say that, uh, that there were efforts constantly by people from all over the world, by different governments, the Poles, uh, the Brazilians, the Canadians, you name it. Everybody was trying to get in on it. Uh, but for various reasons, they never really took hold, or at least they didn't, they didn't have much traction. Uh, another great historian of Vietnam, Fred Logoval, doesn't believe that LBJ was ever really serious about negotiations and that that might explain things. Meanwhile, the domestic scene it gets continually hotter and hotter. 
1966, three out of four Americans still support the war. Uh, but by 1967, Americans are starting to wonder if these sacrifices are, are worth the effort. Uh, William Westmoreland, the, the now much loathed general in the historiography, uh, is dragged back by LBJ in November of 67, where he tells the American people, we are very, very encouraged. I've been, never been more encouraged during my entire almost four years in this country. Everybody's very optimistic uh, who I know of and, and who is intimately associated with our effort there. But that just isn't the, the, the case on the ground. And we're hearing reports of um, mutinies, of fragging of fellow officers, of drug use, of all kinds of things. Uh, just two weeks after Westmoreland makes that statement, Robert McNamara, who is, whose name is associated with this war, who is the Secretary of Defense, and is the subject of Fog of War, which is the film I hope you'll be able to watch, he announces he's resigning. So things are not looking good. January 68, the Tet Offensive happens, one of the, the big moments in the war, a widespread um, attempt by the North to sort of attack multiple targets in the South at the same time. Um, it, ironically, it's not a big success militarily for the North. And it is also apparently true that the American-led South never lost a major battle in this war just as a, as a footnote. The problem was that um, we were not able to win the peace, as the phrase became, and Americans were seeing a very different set of facts on their TV screens uh, than what they were being told. So these kinds of things registered. Uh, at the same time, 1968 is just a horrific year domestically. You have an April, uh, April 4th, Martin Luther King being assassinated, June 5th, Robert F. Kennedy being assassinated, riots are, are uh, started. Um, the political opposition is mounting, uh, reaches a low point in Chicago at the Democratic Convention in 1968, where the Chicago police basically just went crazy uh, and took apart these demonstrators at, at every chance uh, they get. Even official investigations have found this to be the case. Uh, so by this time, LBJ has called it a day. He's announced he's not going to run for re-election. And uh, Hubert Humphrey is um, his nominated successor loses to Richard Nixon. Nixon's the one. Just quickly, how did Nixon approach the war in 1969? Uh, his idea was to leave Vietnam in peace with honor. Peace with honor. He adopted something called Vietnamization, uh, which involved many things, a pacification program, uh, a key component of which was a Phoenix program, which was intended to neutralize the Viet Cong, but which included assassinations and other heinous activities. Um, he continued the, the attempts at negotiation. This is Henry Kissinger down at the bottom at the Paris peace talks that continued uh, throughout this event, he halted the draft. There was a draft, which was a crucial part of this war. Uh, but he also took some aggressive steps. He uh, carried out secret bombings of Cambodian sanctuaries. Uh, in April of 1969, the U.S. invaded Cambodia. This is also in secret. Um, important to keep in mind that Nixon also had bigger fish to fry. He was a grand strategist. And his big aim in foreign policy was to uh, was to have detente with both communist China and the, the Soviet Union, which he essentially accomplished in 1972 and both uh, traveling to both capitals in that year uh, and, and breaking new ground. But domestically, things continue to deteriorate. Cy Hirsch, one of the great investigative reporters of all time, seen on the phone there, uh, is given a story that he pursues and turns into a Pulitzer Prize winner about a massacre in a village called My Lai in 1968 that has become part of the, the lore of Vietnam. Uh, the commanding officer was a 26-year-old named Lieutenant Kelly, uh, who they, they believed there was something, you know, well over 100 uh, people were apparently massacred. They ended up trying him for something like two dozen, and he ended up serving, I think, less than three years. Others who were charged were not uh, found guilty. 
And this became a big dividing line in, in US society. And again, showed American forces doing things that we found very difficult to accept back in those days. Uh, demonstrations continued. This is an epic moment in 1970 when the National Guard at Kent State University in Ohio opened fire live rounds on student demonstrators. And this became one of the, the epic photos of the time. In the middle of all this, people recognize this building and recognize your campus next to it. Uh, the Watergate scandal is, is burgeoning. So Nixon has something else on his mind uh, and another reason to get out. And so negotiations continue. Finally, in January of 1973, the Paris Peace Accords are signed and uh, the war is formally brought to an end, although it continues for some time. Uh, very important things domestically happen. Soldiers, of course, return. This was a, another Pulitzer Prize winning photo of a returning POW, prisoner of war, named Lieutenant Colonel Robert Sturm being greeted by his family. There's a story behind that photo that I don't have time to get into, but I will if you'd like later on. Um, fighting goes on. It's unclear how, how convinced Nixon and Henry Kissinger were that this peace treaty would accomplish much, but it didn't take, took two years for the North to finally win over the South and, uh, and bring uh, just uh, an egregious end to this conflict from the side of the United States, certainly in the South of Vietnam and others. Okay, let me quickly go through some lessons and then we will take a break here. I've taken a long time. Um, first of all, it cost LBJ a second term. It changed American politics, got Nixon into office. Uh, it was a huge blow to U.S. reputation and prestige worldwide. This wry bit of humor says it all. Participant, Southeast Asia War Games, second place. You used to see those all over the place. Um, this was a TV war. Uh, journalism at its height and uh, incredibly influential in this process, although not determinate, determinative as people who are critical of the media uh, have insisted for years and years. The media, by and large, according to studies, very solid academic studies, was mainly reflecting the information they were getting from American officials on the ground and things they were seeing with their own eyes. Uh, they, were, they were not a group of you know, disloyal uh, people who wanted to see the U.S. suffer. Um, the results of the war called into question these big rationales for the Cold War. Remember the wise men in the 1940s. Why on earth are we fighting a population on the other side of the world that still lives like this? I went to Vietnam as a, a part of a, a project that brought Robert McNamara there. And I'll talk about that at some point if you want. But um, I was of draft age. I, I, I had a draft number. And if they continued the draft, I, odds are I might have had to go. So I was deeply interested in seeing what the place looked like when I got there. And this is what I saw. You drive from the airport and you see rice paddies and you see oxen and you see things that haven't changed in a thousand years. Anyway, lots of big questions being asked about what the nature of the U.S. Uh, mission is in the world and so on. Um, so, yes, it significantly altered, at least brought into question the U.S. global approach. Um, Nixon brought into being what was called the Nixon Doctrine in 1969, which said that the U.S. will now, from now on, only assist its allies uh, it, by economic and other means, but it will be up to them to defend themselves. Uh, through military might, so they pull back militarily. It changed our war fighting strategy. The big criticism was that these guys, Westmoreland and others, were fighting the last war, they were fighting World War II, and that was those were totally different conditions than the jungles of Vietnam. The Vietnam syndrome became a thing uh, that we can discuss too, if you want, and it was something that was still relevant, still relevant to this day. But George W. Bush in declaring. Um, mission accomplished in Iraq, uh, announced that the Vietnam syndrome had been done away with once and for all. Uh, certainly an open question. 
uh, and uh, I think incredibly important, it widened dramatically the gulf in American society between left and right, between you know hippies and hard hats, between conservatives and liberals. Uh, that I think is no um, understatement to say that it is a big part of the explanation for where we are today. Uh, this terrible state of, of partisanship that we have where one side simply doesn't believe the other and, and wishes uh, ill of the other. Uh, you can trace a lot of this back to the rancor of the days in Vietnam. Okay, so let me stop there and let you catch your breath. And I'm gonna come back and very quickly go through uh, the, the um, skill building ideas of reading a book and reading a document. Okay, so take a break for a couple of minutes. I certainly will, and we'll come back, and, and we'll start up again. I'll just be off for a couple of seconds, but you can pause for as long as you need. Okay, I'm back, and I think you can see me. So here's what I want to say about reading a book. I was never told some basic things when I was a student. One of the main things being, you cannot possibly read every assignment that you're given in the detail that your professors want you to, if you're carrying four or five, six courses you got to figure out a way to make it count. Uh, and that's what this is about. So when I used to look at my assignments and it would say, you know, read such and such a book or such and such a chapter, I would at least most of the time dutifully open to the first page and start reading. Big mistake. The issue is that, as, as I've implied, you don't have time to do this. That means you have to make decisions about what, how you're gonna spend that time and what you're gonna focus on. Uh, so when you get an assignment, and very often, obviously, professors are going to say, you know, just read this chapter or just focus on this section or something like that. And, you know, yeah, okay, then you do it to the best of your ability. But even then, there, there are ways to be more judicious about it. So, but let's take a book to start with. If you can see this book, this is a book that, Hard to make it work. Um, it's a book that I wrote on the Iran-Contra affair. Let me see if I can. I can fix my background. I don't think I'm going to be able to. So we're, we're just going to have to skip it. Um, there we go. Okay, so here's the book. I hope it's not backwards for you. Um, what I do nowadays when I see a book, especially let's not even take a, an assignment as our as our case, but let's say I, I'm going to do a research paper on a, a foreign policy topic that I don't know a lot about, and I got to collect a lot of sources. So this is really applicable for your 
what you're about to do uh, with your papers. Um, I am going to be presented with dozens, probably, of books and dozens of articles that relate, and it's up to me to figure out which ones to use. So with that in mind, uh, I, I hopefully have an idea of what I want to focus on. If I don't know my thesis statement exactly, at least I know I want to look at, uh, let's say, you know, Ronald Reagan's role in um, in foreign policy, um, or in Iran Contra or Iran policy, for example. So I pick up this book and I see I look I'm, I'm looking for clues. And the question I'm asking is, is this book relevant for me? And if it is, what parts of it are relevant to me? And that takes a little bit of legwork. So I start with the, the title and go Iran Contra. Okay, it has to do with Iran, but it's not all about Iran. It's about one aspect, this scandal that took place during his administration. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I've already gotten closer to an answer to my question. Then I look, uh, I, actually what I tend to do is I tend to look at the back cover and just see what do people think about this? Of course, these are, they're not paid statements in most cases, but they're, they're from either, they're from friendly people. Otherwise, I wouldn't put them on the back of the book. So you can discount the where it says the most amazing book you've ever read. But if it says this is the first account that goes into real depth on this important issue, then that's a clue to you that, okay, somebody who's worth having their name on your back of your book thinks that this is a, a useful thing. That's good. Uh, then I tend to go and I, I look at um, the table of contents. And I see to the extent that it is descriptive at all, what exactly does this show? If I'm looking at, at how Reagan dealt with Iranian officials directly, let's say, then I would be looking for chapters that might uh, indicate that. Uh, and if I see something there that looks promising, okay, then I keep going. If I don't see something, if I see that it's it really, it's all about uh, you know the internal politicking behind the decisions and it's it's domestic politics and it's all that kind of stuff and it's where Reagan grew up. It has nothing to do with how he dealt with Iranians. Not interested. Put it aside. Go to the next book. But you know, be be careful. I mean, think about these things. But uh, but if you see it that clearly, toss it. Next thing I do is um, I will. They all have you know four words and they have introductions and prefaces and all this kind of stuff. So I have. In my book, I had a preface um, on setting the stage for the scandal. And that's worth skimming just to see, you know, what uh, what I have to say about it. Um, it's kind of a, a, a microcosm of what uh, uh, of, of what's to come. But what I'm also looking for, either in the preface or the introduction, uh, which I, I also do, is what certainly academic books often do which is they do give you a little synopsis of everything, especially if it's an edited volume, if it's if it's a bunch of essays in the volume, then the editor is going to sit there and say, you know, this book's aim is blah, blah, blah. And it, it, each chapter treats a different aspect of it. In chapter one, Professor so-and-so writes about, you know, uh, Iran's experience with previous U.S. presidents. In chapter two, uh, this person discusses Ronald Reagan's approach to foreign policy in general and how Iran fits into it. Blah, blah, blah. So what you're getting there is a little snapshot. You don't have to read the whole book. You just say, okay, that's what these chapters are. And there again, you're making a choice. If you see anything that looks relevant, good, fine. If you see something that doesn't look relevant and, and people are usually good enough uh, at this level to you know give you an accurate picture of what's there. Uh, and if it doesn't look like it's relevant, toss it or, or ignore those parts of the book. So right there, you probably cut, you know, two thirds of the of your would be reading out of your life. Uh, then the next thing I do would be to go to the the relevant chapters, and and take a look. And uh, in my case, I made a point because I had me in mind as a reader of starting each chapter with a synopsis, and that would make me in my current pose before you, uh, very happy because I could see right there, oh, all right, this is the, these are the events that that this discusses. And that's very important to, you know, to what I'm looking at. So, okay, I know that I want to read this. Then if I do want to read this, then I go and I look at, at, at any other clue I can find that tells me where to look and what I'm going to see here. 
So um, the subheads are very important. And I would say they're important in your paper that, that you're thinking of. So you can, and I try to make, um, make the subjects somewhat clear. So the reemergence of Israel. If you're interested in Israel, okay, there you go. Um, and that way I'm looking for kind of the structure of, of, the, of the chapter. Each chapter is a mini book, right? I mean, a book is basically a, a, an agglomeration of little structured essays. Um, and so each essay is itself a structure. And so I'm looking to see how it is structured and what it's going to say that's going to help me. Another very important thing to do, and you might even do it before you go to this length, uh, let's say before you, you start hitting the chapters, what I'd like to do, and I think a lot of people would, would agree, is I, I, I go straight to the footnotes after that. Um, and what I'm looking for, assuming I want to do a paper that has some originality to it and isn't just a, a summary of what's been written, I want to see where this person got their information. If they're getting it all from CNN, from you know, uh, the Washington Examiner from Newsweek, blah, blah. Uh, and it's supposed to be a, the inside story of US policy toward Iran. I, I'm i gonna be suspicious. If this person doesn't have you know, a lot of sites to primary sources, to interviews that they've done and other things of that sort, then if I'm already someone who has some knowledge of this subject, the odds are I'm not going to find out a whole lot that I didn't know. But if this is a person who spent a few years in the archives and doing interviews uh, and finding stuff that I have not done, even if it is stuff that I've done, I'm going to be much more interested in it because this is someone who is probably doing original work. So the quality of the sources and the nature of the sources is very important uh, for figuring this stuff out. Um, okay, so then you go through the chapter and 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 you look at the at the structure, and then you know just be simple. Do read the 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 start and the end. Read and for the book too, read the introduction and the conclusion. Go ahead straight to the conclusion if you want. See what it says. This isn't a mystery novel. This isn't something that you know you surprised by the ending. You want to know is this person make sense? This is the other part of it. How is their argument? Do they do they do a good job? Do they Pose the right questions. Do they um, come up with with reasonable answers? Do they make sense? Um, and again, back to the sources. Do they use their sources appropriately, or are they, you know, kind of is it unclear where they got this information from? Because, you know, I don't believe that they got, um, you know, insights into Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, upbringing from. You know, from Newsweek or from from uh, documents that relate to Ronald Reagan's childhood. You know what I mean? So you're you're looking for things like that 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 help tell you how good a job this person did. And and that's what it amounts to. So it's it's essentially saying don't pick up a book from page one and read through page four hundred uh, unless it's a novel or unless it's actually your assignment and you're supposed to do it for some reason. But for your own purposes, uh, you you need to be more active. And that's what this boils down to, being an active reader, taking charge, taking responsibility. And this is, I think, where you know you draw the line between student and instructor, student and professor, or uh, someone who's, who's starting out and someone who is becoming more expert at a subject of whatever it is. Um, and the, the divider is how much responsibility you take for what you're doing, for the time that you are taking out for this. And I would argue strongly that you as students owe it to yourselves to take that active role. Uh, yes, of course, you have to do the assignments that I've given, and you got to listen to me talk and this kind of thing. But you don't have to agree to, with me, and you don't have to, to um, agree with the books that I pick. Just because it's a book doesn't mean it's right doesn't mean it's the only opinion that matters. You need to take the responsibility and uh, decide for yourself what you agree with, what you don't agree with, and so on. That is easier said than done because it takes a lot of 
brain power that takes a lot of intellectual energy to to be active. It's one thing to passively sit there and flip the pages and go, yeah, okay, I read the so-called read 30 pages today. I don't remember anything I read, but you know, but I spent two hours on it. That's one thing. But if you're going, okay, I need to know X and I I want to figure out what this person has to to add that's going to help me. You you are being very active in that process, and uh, you again, I believe you owe it. We all owe it to ourselves to uh, to make an effort to come to our own conclusions about these things. And again, why is this easier said than done? Because to come to your own conclusions means that you have to do the work of checking, you know, looking at these sources and and deciding for yourself with all you know good intentions, um, and doing this this you know honestly. Um, are these good sources? Did the person do the job right? Did did they make? Do their arguments follow from from their sources? Do they? Uh, does it make sense what they're saying? All these things mean that you have to use critical thinking, and that uh, that's where the challenge comes. But it's also by far where the the biggest rewards come. So that's my spiel, and um, I hope that that it, it makes some sense to you. It does take an effort. And it goes along with being a good um, note taker and things of that sort. So, uh, but well worth it. Okay, you can pause if you want. I'm going to go straight to the next and final thing, which is the reading a document. Okay, so you should be able to see this now. This is... Another book that I wrote, I wrote it with my son uh, as our COVID project a couple of years ago, where he also works more or less in, the, in this area. He, he, um, he has a job where he looks at the history of the Middle East and, um, and focuses on documents. I look at American documents. He tends to look at Iranian documents, Egyptian documents, Iraqi documents, and so on. So we thought, why don't we you know, do something jointly. And we did what's essentially a handbook on U.S.-Iran relations. It's an area that we both have an interest in. Um, and so we we picked 60-something documents from our both of our jobs that we had, had um, were very familiar with and, and put them in a book with some head notes that describe why this document is important and some footnotes and some other explanatory materials that help uh, anybody from a beginner to really an expert um, figure out some of this history. And again, it's, it's not in our words. I mean, we we put some context in, but it is in the words of the people who wrote these documents, who are high level officials or you know Iranian clerics or intelligence experts or something like that. Anyway, fun project. One of the things that we did was to put together this. Uh, since it's a book of documents and it was aimed at students primarily, uh, this is what we what we put together. Um, and it's part of your reading, so it may be familiar to you already. I'm not going to go through all this, but here's the point. The point is that when you're reading a document, and you, these are all these questions that you can ask yourself. Um, when you're reading a document, again, it's not a passive exercise. It's an active exercise. And it... it a document contains all kinds of clues uh, that are valuable to you. If you are an analyst, a historian, an intelligence expert, a policymaker, a journalist, whatever you end up being, you're you're going to want to do what amounts to reading between the lines. That's what this really is. It's reading between the lines. What can you glean from the information that you have here? So. Let's start from here. What kind of document is this? And I took a State Department cable, um, I, I guess it's a memo, as as a, a sample. Um, but obviously, this works with, with pretty much anything. What kind of document is it? It's an information memorandum. That tells you something. If it's a speech, you know it's something for public consumption. It's something that took a lot of time uh, to work on. It was written by committee in most cases. Uh, it reflects a, a broad point of view about something. It's intended to wow you with its rhetoric and its its uh, purple prose, and and create an impact on you. You you know all these things just because it's a speech. If it's a 
uh, if it's a letter, you know it's from one person to another and probably not for anybody else's eyes. It's probably quite personal. Um, it is personal reflections. It, um, you know, it, it's it's something that tells you a story about the person who wrote it and something about the his or her relationship with the person that they wrote it for. If it's an information memorandum like this, it is clearly uh, something that is designed to convey information about this topic, the subject, Iran-Iraq war, analysis of possible US shift from strict neut neutrality. So government documents mm -hmm. like this, their aim is to be clear, simple, precise, not academic, turgid texts that go on forever and ever. Uh, everything should be you know, strictly to the point. Um, and in fact, you can see here, the first paragraph sets it up. It's sort of like, okay, here's what this is about. Boom, and now I'm gonna tell you what, what it's all about. But before we get to that point, we, are, we ask ourselves other questions. Who's the author? Uh, in this case, it's two State Department officials. But what you're asking from a, a, in who's the author is really what's their background? What's their point of view? What's their, their academic um, education? What is their political position? Um, are they a polemicist? Are they, you know, a, a talking head on TV? Are they a, you know, an analyst in the bowels of, of the CIA? Uh, is it a professor who, you know, for whatever reason, is it a, a, a you know, the, the parent of a, um, of a, of a terrorist victim or a hostage or something like that? You know, all of these things convey to you a lot of meaning, a lot of information. So I happen to know who these guys are, their career foreign service people, they're smart guys, et cetera. What is the subject? All right, well, who's the audience is, is next. <clears throat> That's very important because uh, a lot of times you'll see in these cables, it'll say eyes only, meaning whoever the addressee is, that's the only person who's supposed to see this. Uh, eyes only for the Secretary of State, eyes only for the President, or, you know, it'll say that you even, I, I've seen things destroy after reading kind of thing. So if if it's a very tight audience, you get a, an idea that this is sensitive stuff. The person doesn't want you and me to know about this, uh, at least at the time. Uh, but if it's something like this, where there's a standard list of offices that this goes to, this is something that's going to be seen by dozens of people. So probably not likely to be so sensitive. In addition, you can see that uh, it it was previously classified. I, I, I forget what this was. I can't even see. Secret. <clears throat> Secret sensitive. There's a kind of a running joke in the, in the government that if you want something to be noticed, stamp it top secret. Um, if it's only confidential, it's probably not worth your time. Now, these are, of course, you know, like I say, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but that's something too. If it's if it's classified secret, eh, it should be you know relatively sensitive. If it's top secret, even more. If it's code word above that, then you're starting to get serious in terms of really uh, information that somebody wanted protected at a, at one point. Uh, what's the subject? Okay, here it's got a subject line. That's that's very helpful. Um, what is the purpose? And this is a gets a little bit trickier because, like I say, in a speech, you know what the purpose is. It's to sell you on on my point of view. Pretty much anything that's written is, um, you know, well, I can't say that because there are certain things that are purely informational, right? Nobody's trying to sway you one way or the other. It's just this is a report on the auto accident that occurred on the Beltway yesterday evening, um, that kind of thing. Here in a memo. As often as not, there's some either implied, if not explicit, um, argument being made. Um, so in this case, it's you asked for our views on the present validity of our war, of our policy. Uh, so you know you're going to get a point of view here. If they're worth their salt, they have put good evidence in there. They may not have footnotes. It's not an academic treatise, but they're going to have evidence. You. Don't win arguments without evidence. And I'm going to insist on this in the papers. Uh, this is not an op-ed that you're going to be writing where you can just say what you want. Even op-eds, if you read them carefully, they almost always, if they're well-written, 
they will have some evidence there saying, you know, as as you as we all saw at, in 9-11, you know, terrorism is a big problem or something like that. Somebody's always referring to some source or other. Um, and in fact, that's one of the key things that you're looking for when you are a reader of anything. How good are the sources? Do they refer to sources? Is this just their point of view? If it's a, a philosophy paper, okay, fine. Maybe that's that's you know what that's all they need to do. But if you're looking as a historian or or a consumer of history or the news, uh, you need to be satisfied with with much more than that. Okay, um, what do you need to know more about the content? Uh, there's different little things in here that tell you what our position is on the war, uh, how things have changed what our relationship with Iran is, what have you. Um, those are all very important parts of understanding the the the, the guts, the content of a, of a document or a paper, a text of any kind. So those are some of the things that that you want to look out for. Go through this and and read these questions. I think they're pretty good uh, and they give some some uh, some thought as well. And you may have your own ideas. Some of this may be very obvious to you, but I don't think it'll be obvious to everybody because uh, unless you really are, you know, are um, have an instinct for this or are taught this, which again I was not taught <laughs> in my day, then there's no reason why you would necessarily know uh, to ask yourself all these questions. But they, these are as valid. Okay, some of these wasn't classified and so on. Are, are very specific to government documents, but many of these questions are just as valid for reading a newspaper article or a blog entry or listening to a a, um, a panel discussion or a talking head on on TV as for any other uh, anything else that's been produced by by humans. Okay, that is all I have to say on that, and I think I'm I'm pretty close to a couple hours, so. Um, thank you again for for dealing with these circumstances. I hope that uh, that this has been helpful, and I hope that you got something out of the Vietnam part, and that it uh, mixed well with the uh, the CNN videos. And I'm really curious to hear what you think about the films that you're either you've watched or you're going to be watching. Um, thinking about them as statements by, you know, Hollywood, yeah, but by thinking people about the war, what are they telling you? Which, whatever movie or movies that you watched, what is the point of view that's being presented? What are the politics of the people who put it together? How did they go about trying to uh, argue their case to you? What are they like the the scenes that I've mentioned that kind of warned you about that might be shocking, uh, that are violent or something unsettling? Why are those there? Why are they putting them in there? Why did they choose those scenes? Uh, what might they have have included that they did not? And why did they make that decision? If these kinds of things occur to you, and make notes of them. Again, this is a, you know this is a history class. You've got to get used to the idea of taking notes. And several of you have told me that you have a lot of experience with that, which is terrific, but it's a really important habit to get used to, uh, regardless of what you're studying or what you're what you're doing, wh whatever you're looking into. If you're looking into buying a, you know, a washing machine, you, it's a good idea to, you know, to keep track of what you've been looking at and, and what you thought about things and where you got the information. Uh, all of these things that we're going to be doing have applications well beyond history. So I think that is all that I have to say. Uh, we're continuing with Vietnam, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. So thanks again, and don't hesitate to email me with any questions, and um, we'll see you in a week. <laughs>